Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name is Yifong, and with me is Lily. Hey, Fong, what's going on? Hey, what's going on? How have you been? Good. Uh, I was just saying earlier, I did a film shoot last night, and I got home at 3 a.m. this morning, so even though I had a nice nap, I'm still super tired. <laughs> That's okay. That just means that if you're incoherent somehow, we'll, uh, we'll understand why. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's not the movie, right? It's it's uh, just you're tired. So, mm-hmm. um, so today, uh, and what we can do in, on uh, watching silent films is we'll pick a feature or a series of shorts and watch it and talk about it. That's what we do on this podcast. And this week, we're going to talk about D.W. Griffith's Intolerance from 1916, his follow up to, of course, The Birth of a Nation. Um, before we get to that, did you happen to have a chance to watch anything in the classics, um, realm just in general? If not, that's okay. Oh, I'm trying to think. I feel like I did, but I probably didn't. And my mind is just it's telling me I did. Cause I was thinking, you mentioned something I... last week. So you, you, you yeah. might be thinking about that. Some silent um, movie you already seen last week. I know. Love's, not Love's Labor's Lost. I'm thinking that's like yeah. some Shakespeare play. It was like when the world stood still. But yeah, I watched that the week before. So for I have not watched anything new this week just because I was kind of busy. And But hey, there's plenty of silent films. I was talking to a couple people last night about some silent films and saying how you know good they actually can be. So that's a plus. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, you're uh, doing right by silent films then. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The uh, I hadn't really seen a lot of old silent film classics, but I have recently been going through um, this filmmaker, Hong Kong filmmaker, um, Wong Kar Wai's filmography. I think I mentioned it before. So I just finished, uh, what did I finish? 2046, which is the year that in theory, so, I, well, okay, I'm gonna, not going to take too long on this, but uh, Hong Kong, of course, uh, reverted from you know british overseas you know overseeing them in mm-hmm. into china's hands in 1997 i think most people historically understands that and technically they have until 2046 before um like the communist chinese mainland Ch- communist party takes over the government hmm. right if you know that, but that's uh no, I didn't know that. But very that's high level. Really that's what it's supposed to be. That's supposed to be in there. Of course, if you are paying attention to the news, that's why there there are news articles saying there are now laws in place where the mainland Chinese sort of government is already uh, not adhering to that and kind of already taking over Hong hmm. Kong rule and stuff like that. So it's supposed to remain as is. Like don't touch it until twenty forty six. It's supposed to be the rule. You know what I mean? And that's why people were yeah. just crying foul and saying how it's a violation of human rights, et cetera. But honestly, my personal opinion is like the moment in 1997 it took over, it just wouldn't it wouldn't have lasted long anyways, in my opinion. It's like that was a good thought, 2046, but it's like. <laughs> well, yeah, now we're like 20 years away from that. Right. I mean, but either well, you know way, it's I mean. like <laughs> it's it's it's, you know, China and Chinese communist party they're not gonna care about some arbitrary 2046 rule you know what i mean yeah like, it's like oh yeah yeah i respect <laughs> that rule <laughs> anyway so the movie actually is about some of the fears about that whole transition hence the whole sort of number 2046 and you know hong kong filmmaker and stuff hmm. he's actually not i don't think he's a native he's from beijing originally or somewhere but anyways a uh, great film. Uh, it's the last movie where he is, he's frequently collaborating with a uh, cinematographer called uh, Christopher Doyle, who is, I think, an American that is basically now expat. He's kind of living abroad everywhere now and making movies. Mm. He's one of the greatest cinematographers. We're at the with uh, Roger Deakins nowadays, working. I think mm. still working. So, anyways, it, it's beautiful looking movies, all of his. Uh, I think it's the last collaboration. And after that, and then like, next two movies, uh, they, they, some, I haven't found out the story why, but they, they don't, they don't really work with each other anymore. So anyways, hmm. that's what I've been watching. It's a tremendous uh, filmography still. And uh, that's one of the uh, great piece of film. If you're uh, into that stuff. Mm. All right. What was what turned you on to just watching it just because of the unique aesthetic? 
Yeah, it's one of those things I I wanted to get to, but it's also for a project too that I'm not ready to announce yet. But I, eventually I will uh, get to. <laughs> That's okay. Um, all right, so let's keep moving forward here. Um, let's dive into the feature itself, which is D.W. Griffith's 1916 Intolerance. This is about something like two and a or three and a half hour or something like that movie something like uh that. yeah when i first read oh, our text message i was like what I almost, <laughs> I, I almost wanted to talk to you about like did i read this wrong because i wasn't thinking intolerance was that long i thought it was a typo like uh-huh. oh i can see like two or one and a half like three that's what? why I, that's why i said you know you were like yeah, yeah i should watch this i was like you really though do you really though <laughs> do i really <laughs> yeah like you know Three and a half hours. I did. Do you really? <laughs> oh man, D.W. Griffith loves them long takes. They're, actually, there weren't even long takes; just long movies. Yeah, oh. he, yeah. So <laughs> he had he made shorts in the Biograph days when he was um, a young buck, or sort of starting out in filmmaking. But uh, after he got sort of um, getting into features, graduate, and that's what happens to a lot of filmmakers of those days is that you would go from shorts just like Buster Keaton did mm-hmm. and you graduate quote unquote from sort of so honing your directing skills uh, in the short movies and then you take your skills and kind of passed forward or paid forward or however you use that term to so- sort of work on feature films and then pretty much you typically don't turn back anymore once you're in proper feature mm-hmm. sort of roles um as a director so that's essentially what he's done is that he graduated from biograph shorts into obviously birth nation and then he did this and on he would just be making features i think i i don't i haven't really um read through his entire filmography because i'm not 100 percent sure sometimes people do revert back to shorts it's not mm. uh, um out of the ordinary but uh but typically uh filmmakers of this stature typically would do that but uh, all right, so what did you think of this tremendously long movie? <laughs> three and a half hours. Um. Well, I know where Buster Keaton got the idea for his film, The yeah, three, three Ages. ages. So there exactly. we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't hate it. Uh, I wouldn't say I loved it. But oh, we should a... do a quick Ooh. synopsis. Sorry. Oh, I yeah. I <laughs> always forget this part. Um, I mean, not always, but often. Uh, how do I even talk about the plot? So <laughs> they said it's like this. It's four corresponding exactly. stories. Yeah. So instead of the three ages, which is what Buster Keaton did for the sake of a shorter movie, <laughs> hmm. um, which is a homage to this movie. Um, it's kind of a satire of this movie. Uh, intolerance in intolerance there's four separate storylines there is a modern story um between a sort of boy and a girl story kind of essentially Mm -hmm. and what happens to them after they're pushed out of work and they're kind of down under their luck and how they kind of find each other again after they you know go through some tough times the guy gets into some underworld uh, gangster lifestyle as it were and um there's some struggles ensues and ultimately you know he he was accused of murder and he got uh, ultimately uh redeemed and um uh, uh redeemed at the end and th- that's story one uh story two is ancient babylon the fall of uh, babylon basically is the whole story of the empire um specifically of the between uh Prince uh, Belshazzar of Babylon and also Cyrus the Great of Persia, who is taking over that. And the third mm-hmm. one is the Renaissance French story, where it in ta- basically talks about. Uh, uh, so the first story takes place roughly 1914, around the story of when the film takes place. The second of Babylon, Fall of Babylon, is 539 BC, roughly. And the third one is the Renaissance French, around 1572, I think. 16th century and it talks about the saint bartholomew's day which is the massacre of uh, protestant huguenots by um catholic loyals royals sorry Hmm. not loyals and then the fourth and final story is the biblical judean story of this christ and his leading up to his crucifixion essentially of uh, 2780 roughly so 
that's the four intertwining stories. They're not told sequentially one after the other. They're intercut, mm -hmm. uh, just like the Three Ages, which is kind of taking off of this. And just like I think even when we talked about it in that podcast about uh, a modern equivalent would be like Ho Cloud Atlas, the Tom Hanks mm -hmm. movie. There's probably others, but that's the one I can think of off the top of my head because I, I have seen that movie. There may be others. I, I don't. I haven't researched. I don't really know. <laughs> Yeah, I, wanted, I was thinking about the Cloud Atlas when I was watching this as well, but I, that's one I'm going to have to watch now just because of, you know, now we've watched three movies with the same concept. So I'm like, I got to see this. <laughs> yeah, and the conceit behind it is that there are themes in each of the separate stories that might, might potentially speak to one another across the time periods is essentially what it's, it's kind of talking about. And uh, so, anyway, sorry to interrupt. So, continue your thoughts about intolerance. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was like just saying, didn't love it, didn't hate it, but it, well, besides the fact it's long. <laughs> uh, I mean, cinematography wise, very cool. Costume design also pretty nice. I like the Babylonian era. The French was pretty fancy. Uh, what else did I love about it? I finally got to, so there's like two parts to this movie, uh, when we watch it on Canopy. Uh, so the main, like the most famous shot from this film is looking down on the Babylonian, uh, city. And then it just slowly pans down into it, which is really cool. And that's what people reference usually when they talk about intolerance, this one shot. But I thought it was going to be at the very beginning of the film itself. I was surprised it was in the second act and kind of a little ways in. Um, I don't know. It's, it, it's like with this film, I felt as if... Because there were the four corresponding stories once again, and they weren't with the same actors, I don't think. Am I wrong? Were all the same actors playing similar roles in each section? I don't uh, think so. Not this am, time. Not this time. Yeah, they are separate. Pretty sure. Okay, I, w I was. That's what I. I mean, I was trying to find faces like with the three ages to see oh. if it was similar, but no. Um. I. Yeah, I couldn't really just care for anybody. I think the people I most related to were like the their their titles were like the little wife or the the dear one. It's the same woman, right? And and the boy, which is her husband. I felt kind of the most uh not not even connected. I cared the most about their situation because it's during um prohibition and. The, the wife's husband gets, oh God, he gets sent to jail and then her baby's sick while he's in jail. So he didn't even know he had a baby. And she's like, you know, back then, let's try some whiskey. And then these, these stupid women for prohibition, these, ah, these feminist ladies with their stupid hats and their stupid faces come in. They're like, we're taking your baby. And I'm like, okay, no. And then you don't even know what happens to the baby at the end. It just stays in like a shelter. Oh, that made me mad. <laughs> But uh, uh, I don't. I couldn't even just tell. Really describe intolerance. I mean, I, I, I love words. I love language. But I still had to look up what the word intolerance meant because you know, just thinking of it as its standalone, uh, uh, you know, dictionary word. I'm like, I don't know. I can't describe it. But intolerance means the unwillingness to accept views, beliefs, or behavior that differ from one's own, which is like, okay, I understand that part of the film now and why everybody was kind of arguing with each other in one respect. But still, it's like, I mean, I guess it kind of correlates to now, just as it will throughout time, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement or, you know, the issues you were just mentioning in China, where China is not... You know, they don't really care about the 2047 rule, you know? Yeah, <laughs> Do you have any comment on that? 2046, yeah, 2046. excuse me. So, uh, I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that Those are all very... It's about any and all of those points, essentially. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So, you know, my take on this is that my relationship to this movie is like, 
I think the last time I I I seen this was oh and by the way <laughs> we're so into this podcast now mm -hmm. but uh, Bob is gonna be out until next week so he'll rejoin us next week okay uh, I think <laughs> things that we should be talking about at the top of the hour I'm just uh, slowly 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 peppering it in <laughs> oh man I like that though he just like by yeah, the like, way throw it, it in there it feels like amateur <laughs> hours sometimes but um anyways uh getting back to the movie. My uh, the last time I remember watching this is probably you know like early two thousands you know when I was going mm. through D W Griffith's filmography, and uh, I'm pretty sure I've seen almost all of his movies, uh, at least the feature ones. I I didn't think that the shorts were easily available in early two thousand, at least that I, I was aware of, and so it, it may have been. But I remember that at least most of his features I've seen. And so this is just simply one of those features I've seen. And hmm. then as well as now, uh, the and same thing with The Birth of the Nation. So in spite of whatever content, whatever you think about the actual content, whether it's the, the racism of The Birth of the Nation or, or anything inside of Intolerance, the movie itself, it, it, there's his sort of technical skill is definitely there, right? So like, mm. you know the birth of the nation is a very linear story. And so I think that uh, that kind of plays well, if that makes sense. Um, and mm -hmm. right off of the popularity of the birth of the nation, um, the, uh, the Griffith was basically taking advantage of his fame and fortune at that time. It was saying, well, you know, now that I'm here, let's, let's kind of go for broke his original premise was actually just to make the modern story, mm. um, which is, uh, you know, with the, the girl and the boy, essentially. So he his original script, his idea, as it were, uh, he didn't have actually finished script. He was just like, he, he just wanted to make that story about the boy and the girl, and that's it. Hmm. Um, but... You know, he really loved uh, Italian epics. So, like, when he was watching, at that point, uh, Quo Vadis had come out, which is a movie. Uh, just essentially, it's like a big Italian epic with, you know, casts of hundreds, if not thousands, on the screen. And sometimes there's chariots, there's horses. It's kind mm -hmm. of like, the I don't know if you've heard the phrase sword and sandal movies, like Gladiator, you know? Uh, I haven't heard that phrase, but it seems to, you know. But you remember the movie sense. Gladio with um, Russell Crowe? You remember that? Uh, yes, I, ha I haven't watched it. I, there are so many movies I haven't watched. <laughs> right, right. But the, that movie, basically, when that was, well, Gladio specifically came out in 2000, was a callback to a lot of biblical epics, epics of the 1950s, like Ten Commandments, uh, mm -hmm. Ben Hur. And mm -hmm. it's the, the phraseology is that they have the sword and. And they're wearing sandals. That's the whole notion where these type of movies are entertaining because they, they're they based on sort of epic nature of, you know, those type of movies. So long story short, uh, Italians have been doing that for a while. And uh, D.W. Griffith essentially got jealous. So he mm -hmm. was like, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. So in the middle of creating this modern story, uh, he essentially started to think about what can I do to sort of make this even better than it is and essentially he was like i got it i'll do this multi thing art and you know he he basically wanted to throw everything in there and the kitchen sink <laughs> is the whole reason why he started off adding all these different uh story threads into a single film Makes and so sense. <laughs> yeah so that's the whole premise and how he kind of decided on getting into this stuff uh, but, uh, I, I don't think it hundred percent works the way that he imagined it. However, um, I do have to say that like the grandeur of it is definitely, uh, is, is something worthy of note because like if you, especially the, uh, the Babylon set, like if you look at that set, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Like, mm. obviously, nowadays, it would be done CG. But back then, you saw real-life 
people, and if it was hundreds, if not thousands, of people, then there were hundreds, if not thousands, of people on the screen.、Mm-hmm. You know, and、uh, and he built like, you know, three statues, four statues aside. Yeah, there were... was so many. There's so much detail to it,、yeah. and I mean, as someone who likes, you know, the art department side and you know, props and whatnot, it was just like, wow, <laughs> you know, that's that's why I mentioned it earlier too. Or You know, it just goes on and on、so、and on. It's so epic. It, yeah, it's not just like you know a, a, a quick shot in here and there. And they, of course, did the primary research.、Uh, if you remember, I don't know if you re- read this chapter on the Kevin Brownlow book, the the parade goes by, a book. But in the book, in one of the interviews or discussions, is that they that、uh, Griffith is a person who likes to surround himself with. A lot of people, so he's not one of those people that that does everything himself. But rather, he surrounds himself with all sorts of people, and he kind of just more like a、uh, uh, a commander of a troop, you know. And so,、mm. and he does. And the good thing is that he likes the research, so he has a lot of people going doing go off and do different research. Uh, on how authentic we ought to be doing, because if you look at a lot of the films at that time, they don't always pay attention to the details of research and historic significance. And so,、oh. when you see those Babylonian artwork, it's based on like at at that point in time archaeology what they've dug up. Of course, it's more since that time, right? Since、hmm. the nineteen tens. But at that point, they they've had a lot of research on、uh, Babylonian Assyrian days, and so they are taking what research that they had. And perform primary research, and they took a lot of those、uh, archaeological museum type stuff, and basically recreated that as a set. You know what what you saw in the museums. And that's why there's an air of authenticity, because people can people can link that if people are、uh, a little bit educated and they're visiting museums and they're educating themselves and they can look, look at drawings or pictures. They're like, wow! It, it, at the very least, even if you didn't like any of the stories or anything. You can tell that a serious research, primary research, has been done, and they try to replicate the actual look. And the same applies to the French stories in, in terms of their、mm. costuming and the sets, and what kind of the people, the kind of swords that they were using, and the kind of、uh, fighting techniques or whatever. And you know, same with the crucifixion of Christ, on and on and on. So all those things are there are a lot of details in there. So. Yeah, like,、mm. just like the Birth of the Nation, all those technical pieces—the sets, the costumes, the special effects, the lighting—and you know, this is cinematographer says that Billy Bitzer. Now, there's a famous、uh, author, Lenning or Lemming—I forgot his spelling of his name—but he is a biographer of、uh, D.W. Griffith. It's actually an interview on YouTube, which we should probably link in the show notes. But、mm. in the Eight or nine part sort of interview. He talks about the fact that Bitzer was not an artistic person, but he would get all the technical. He was、uh, cameraman、uh, work correct. Remember, this is still the time where people's roles weren't like totally divided as it is now, like producer、yeah. director. So he's basically the cameraman. So he'll technically know how to operate the cam- camera, but he was actually not an artistic person,、hmm. and so. He just, you know, if a setup is is good and it's efficient, that's all he really cares about. But if like D.W. Griffith is, oh, that shot's really artistic and looks really nice, he's just like, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he yeah, just goes with it. <laughs> looks nice, and he'll just kind of take sort of that. So that's kind of how they made all these movies, which is kind of it, pretty, it, in, yeah, it, pretty it, interesting. It, and yeah,、funny. it explains <laughs> why some of those,、uh, and I think. The person being interviewed,、uh, the biographer, did mention that if you look at editing, how editing should be done is that, you know, if you have a、uh, wide shot, a close-up shot, and a medium shot, when you cut between all of those things, they should somehow be in sync, right?、Mm. So, like, if a person starts to get up, if you cut to a close-up, you should be,、uh, the timeline has progressed a little bit. Right or and then if he sits down again or shakes somebody's hand from left to right, your camera should be following those actions. Well, if you pay attention to this and many of his other movies, they leave too many frames on. So he you you would show often the person getting up two or three times between cuts. Between yeah, when they cut between 
uh, a medium shot, wide shot, close ups. You'll just see it over and over again, just mm-hmm. because again, uh, they kind of go into this hat hats early. They don't again, not a, n- lot, a lot of things were defined uh, as it is now, which is yeah. just shocking if you think about it. Like how these things were made and how people still kind of harken back to how technically great they are or were, but it's like except for some of these little details. <laughs> yeah, cuz I mean, you know, all these continuity checks we have now, they have to be precise and then back then they just, you know, snip <laughs> snip the <laughs> the nitrate. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they, <laughs> and uh, they blew it. <laughs> yeah. Well, the point is, is they they didn't really have a good sort of grasp on continuity. And so, I think uh and this is not based on any uh, interviews, but from what I've read or heard DW Griffith is a little bit like ADD ish. Uh, if if you mm-hmm. were to be diagnosed today, he would be kind of that way. But some of the background information is that when he grew up, he actually attended at most a year of school, like proper schooling. Mm. But other than that, he worked in bookstores and he actually just he would self educate. He would read a lot of books, and mm-hmm. this is why he loves research, just general research, and that's why he, all his films are very well researched. To kind of almost compensate for the lack of like he didn't really go to proper schooling,、mm. you know what I mean? Makes sense、uh, in his own personal life. So anyway, so that's kind of a little bit on him and how he re- relates to how the intolerance movies are made.、Um, I, before we kind of either finish off or keep going, I just do want to make a point though that like it, it's a very like. Conflicting thing because we know that like the birth of the nation, like they are racist elements. Even today, there are many sides of uh, uh, perspectives that that it's a very controversial film, right? Like、mm-hmm. there is a side or perspective that it it's a movie of its time, and like everybody was. In fact, even that biographer in the YouTube、uh, documentary was basically saying. Like what are you talking about? Like ninety nine percent of the people there, you know, in America at that time, nineteen tens, like, you know, they're just racist. I mean, they, that's not a good thing, but that's how people were. <laughs> Ugh, so he's kind、yeah. of like defending like it. It's like slavery, right? Everybody was doing slavery, but that's okay because that's how they were. You know what I mean? Like, well, like in the eighteen hundreds. But the point is, it's、meant. just the point is that it's it, it. There's just a lot of problematic sort of defense of like. You have to remember the context of the time, yeah, and that makes it okay. And it, in some ways, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like a yes, no. That's why it's complicated, right? So you have one perspective saying that, and the other perspective saying, you know, oh, you should know better. And and it, there were protests even then, and of you know how the movie is depiction of encourages,、uh, you know, Ku Klux Klan and racism, and and so. The birth of the nation, of course, is problematic at most, right? In spite of the、mm. technical features, and I, in my travels, when I have chatted with、uh, other silent films or enthusiasts, the ones that who really know silent film history, I think, will say that even if D. W. Griffith did not make the birth of the nation or even Intolerance, either work, that there would have been somebody, maybe of color,、uh, that would have made something like that. Like it, it, it was only a matter of time,、um, and the reason why the history looks back upon these works with a lot of reverence is because one, D. W. Griffith is an incredibly efficient self promoter. Remember some of the background I gave you, which was like the way he grew up was in kind of a very poor environment. He wasn't、mm-hmm. really educated, and so because of his Sort of background, he always felt self conscious about that. Does that make sense? Like the way it shaped、yeah. him as a person,、mm-hmm. and so growing up, he would always feel a sense of pride when he's making these works, right?、Um, yeah, because he's trying to better himself in like kind saying, of, but also like he、do. would also like at the end when he's done with the biograph shorts, he actually took out an ad in one of the trade publications saying he was the first one who came with intercuts. He's First one who did editing. He was the first director who came up with the close-ups. Like he was a self-promoter.、Hmm. So there's a lot of arrogance and pride in where his status was 
as a film director and because other people also lavish praises upon him. During his biograph short stays, as well as The Birth of the Nation and, 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 and Heck Even Intolerant. So throughout all these movies, people just lavish praise upon him and he would in turn take that fame and fortune and kind of add fuel to the fire. And I think that's partially the reason why film historians, remember when we were watching um, the Alice Guy Blachey documentary, mm-hmm. Be Natural? Mm-hmm. where all these historians just would write this film history based on hearsay, like other people's words. They would not actually talk to, they interviewed the primary resource. They had, like they probably didn't even talk to D.W. Griffith yeah, before just reading something about the trip because he himself wrote it. So he's mm-hmm. <laughs> literally writing his own history. Hmm. Um, so I think that's part of some of the problems with his fame and fortune and his position in film history is that as we think as great as it is, all these other other deep researchers of silent film history can tell you several examples. Now, some of these examples uh, is not going to have within that single movie all this technique that he's just done. Like, you know, the way that Birth Nation had a lot of close-ups, medium shots, like all this editing to tell a linear story. Uh, some of them have something close to that, but it's it's not like as uh, refined and thrown in. And that's part, again, part of what makes D.W. Griffith the way he is. He's just like to throw everything in the kitchen sink in, you know, and hmm. almost by happy coincidence and happenance and luck, it came out that way. <laughs> hmm. Same with intolerance. And I think that's part of his sort of M.O. is how he makes these movies. And... Um, and I think that's part of what solidifies this position in film history. Now, since that time, we've had almost hundreds of years now, 100 plus years to not recon, I would say, but rather uh, see it for what it is, that he was like a self-promoter and with the birth of the nation for sort of the more race, specifically racist portions, he would not be apologetic for that because he was basically saying, it is my perspective basically he's kind of defending his racism like yeah that's my movie that's my perspective i have freedom of the press and if you want to make your own movie go ahead and make your own like make your own theme make your own movie about whatever but that's my movie for it and in fact intolerance was doubling down if he was gambling on that he was basically saying he was the one being faulted for sort of speaking his perspective and opinion you know in that movie and he's the one that other people were intolerant of Hmm. like he's supposed to be the shining beacon of like goodness right or i mean he didn't say that but like he's supposed to be the person or the artist who has a perspective where other people were shunting him so his whole premise and foundation behind why intolerance the movie was made and it was titled that way was he felt like everybody was intolerant of him in his movie and his perspective. So with that in mind, I just have a real problem with the movie starting with that mindset. Does that make sense? Like mindset being, I made a racist movie. I'm not going to defend it. I'm going to keep going with this. And heck, everybody's like this anyways. I don't know why you're, you know, uh, attacking me. You're being intolerant of me. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's <laughs> it's like a double edged sword. I mean, exactly. I, uh, I mean, I can agree with that because I get it, but at the same time, it's like no, you gotta no. <laughs> yeah. But then and, and you that's, know that's, that's my that's problem. Twenty twenty perspective. Like, you know, one is that he's unrepentant in in that respect, and he's made a whole movie about defending it. So this movie doesn't have all those themes, the controversial themes, except like. Uh, love and good blah 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 all is you know love is subtitle is like love struggle through the ages so he's basically saying throughout all these time periods between modern times uh between babylon between the french sort of uh days he's basically talking about how like all these people were intolerant all these people's lifestyles and they 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 were intolerant of them and he's putting himself as 
the main characters. You know, he is, you know, the girl and the boy while society was shunting them, right? Or in the Renaissance French story, he was sort of the Protestants, innocent, quote unquote, Huguenot Protestants that got slaughtered mm. by the intolerant Catholics. Or he is Jesus. <laughs> Notice his pride, right, coming in. And he uh, gets crucified by all these, you know, Pharisees, he calls it. Or in Babylon, he's this, you know, uh, quote unquote, good prince, ruler of this Babylon, you know, because he gave uh, freedom to one of the, which is uh, uh, the Talmud sister. Which one started? I think it's Constance, the, the youngest uh, Talmud sister. Hmm. So she started as the mountain girl. So she's the youngest sister of the Talmud sisters, uh. right? To Norma and uh, Natalie, and, Natalie. And, and Constance. So. I think Natalie has a cameo in here too. I, I couldn't spot her. There's so many people. But anyways, and so he's the one that gave her that stamp. Um, remember in the movie where mm-hmm. a prince she can marry whoever she wants. Yeah, you if have she wanted the freedom to. of feminism in you know 539 BC, and mm-hmm. and it's the Cyrus the Great who is the evil, you know, whoever trying to topple his, you know, freedom. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of my problem with this is that as great as some of the technical pieces are, the set pieces, the cast of thousands, the special effects, the lighting and all of the film techniques that we modern day often will attribute to this. But the foundation behind all of that is based on a very shaky premise of like um, race is going to defend it. And yet hundreds of years later, we still have today a lot of film historians who love to say that he's remarkable and he is remarkable, but we're not highlighting the fact that there are many others as well who's doing, you know, similar, if not better work in some of the areas. They may not have um, put everything into a single film, right? There's not like mm-hmm. a single film equivalent of like, the birth of a nation or intolerance, but there are many movies where these film techniques like close-ups and uh, multiple, no, multiple storylines or like, you know, the cross cuttings and all those things were being accomplished by other people. And some, some of them even better, you know? Yeah, of course. So that's my problem with this. It's this. So one is that his sort of unrepentant thing about racism, mm-hmm. all that stuff, which is, very topical today but also too is this just massive sort of egotistic thing like he you know i am great i'm continuing to be great and i, I can do this multiple storylines <laughs> and i'm gonna up one up the italian you know uh epic directors let's let's show him who's gonna do this better and 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 so ugh, that's kind of some ugh. of my conflicting feelings about it and that's just to to set it up <laughs> we haven't oh, even man. dug into the actual movie story i know it's funny you know just i had this idea too because when we were talking about uh within our gates that uh twitter link that i linked to it which is originally what where i found it the lady was so sassy about talk comparing what D- dw griffith was like compared to oscar show and just how basically dw griffith would complain when he didn't get the funding for his movie where it's like Oscar Michaud's just like well just gonna do it anyway <laughs> you know just like he's kind of I don't know a wailing baby in a sense if he doesn't get his way and I'm just like it's talking about it too it's just like yeah you know you got some struggles but who doesn't deal yeah. with it? it it's part of his controversy I think mm-hmm. it's so complicated because as all human beings are is that Anytime that we have modern eyes and audiences trying to point to the fact that, you know, there are some problems with D.W. Griffith movies, uh, you'll often hear the opposition defenders come to his aid saying, well, he was kinda, he's kind of like an ADD guy. And, and he would just grab on. He was like, you know, uh, in the movie Up, there's a dog uh, saying, you know, squirrel. He'll just go to the next thing. And that's kind of how he was. And he he... The defense is that he may not have known that some of these, you know, uh, was going to come out this way, you know, Ugh. whether it's the birth nation or something like that. I'm so rolling my defense. eyes just so you know. <laughs> right. So that's a defense of like, you know, 
yeah, he kind of accidentally became racist. Or later on, he did another movie where it's like where the Asians are very stereotyped, right? Like there's a uh, I forgot the the title now, but there's another movie where where like it's it's one of those cringe worthy uh, movies that hasn't um, aged well. <laughs> <laughs> oh geez uh yeah so he's not racist some. once he, he's <laughs> multiple times but also like another defense of that just like again that's the way the united states was yes it was racist and you kind of just have to face up to it and also like he was again add so there's a lot of these um defenders of uh some of these filmmakers who are kind of just like that and it's really hard to um kind of get behind that sometimes you know so i don't know i'm just bringing up more opening up more cans of worms than than closing them i guess <laughs> you can close cans uh, of worms yeah <laughs> yeah so so that's my feelings about it which is very conflicted is that there are i think so first is I, my view is definitely like a lot of people just want to kind of get rid of it so my stand up about that is that let's not get rid of stuff. Like, you know, I'm not going to reference any modern stuff, but like some, so many times people just want to get rid of the offending thing, kind of the cancel culture. So I don't think that's healthy in general because we need to have something still in place that you can reference so that we know our history so we don't repeat it, right? So that's right. one. Like, don't get rid of, you know, the birth of the nation or intolerance because we know he has some race. About- have people study it like you know african-american studies or you know whether it's asian-american studies or whatever ex-american studies have them look at it and take it apart and and figure out what is the problem with it and 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 identify those problems you know make your make your mark by saying that you know that's the problem with this you know and it's the same thing with all works of art in the past. There are many works of art in the past where it's totally sexist and racist and whatever is. And you know what? They're still here and we can mm-hmm. still read it with like, you know, like, um, like Mark fresh, Twain, you uh, know, not fresh eyes, but is that what you're kind of? Yeah. What I'm saying that? is that you, you, again, like anything, study it with the proper context mm-hmm. so that you're not, you know, either, uh, you know, overselling it or underselling it. You, you just put it into place in the context of where it came out of, what was going on at that time, and so that it makes sense mm. to you, you know? But the notion of, like, getting rid of everything offensive is not healthy either. I think if you scrub... If you try to scrub everything clean, there would be nothing left because everyone has flaws. <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, like, you look at all your friends. They all have flaws. You know, spoiler but- alert. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, you're going to get rid of all your friends? You know, like, you know, it, that's what I'm saying. It's like all these art, all the artists behind them, they all have flaws. You know, whether it's massive or small, they all have flaws. And to have that cancel culture come out and say, anytime you have a flaw, I gotta get rid of it. I think you have to look at, like, how they have grown or not, right? Mm. If you look at the history of D.W. Griffith, he didn't really grow too much, you know? And so that's one of those things that like you have to take into context as you study his work. Right. Or let's fast forward to more modern example, like James Gunn. Right. So James Gunn, if you heard the story, but he Mm-mm. is the director of um, he Gal- did Guardians uh, of the Galaxy volume one to and now three. Well, he was fired by Disney for a while because he had all these like pedophilic, really offensive tweets from way back in the day when he was young. But that was like, five ten years ago you know and huh. again not i am not defending it, it it's probably atrocious and ter- i never I, I i don't think i remember reading it but like you know all that stuff it's 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 like because of social media everything's now there you know but if you mm-hmm. remember back at least i i i still grew up in the era where before so there was a lot of dumb stuff i did as a kid that if it was on social media, <laughs> I'd be in trouble for, you know? Yeah. And that's everyone, you know? And I think they were right in kind of getting him back because they know that that was something that he was doing as part of his shtick, you know, as, as the, in the Twitter world and stuff like that. And so in, in the entertainment industry. 
Yeah. But again, long story short is that cancel culture, um, when it when you trying to get rid of stuff without actually knowing the context, it can be be a little bit dangerous because the funny thing is you're becoming sort of the fascism Nazism type person that you're trying to get rid of, right? The whole point mm-hmm. of like Nazi fashion people is like they want to get rid of people they don't agree with, right? That's the whole premise behind it. And yet, if you are the can- cancel culture and you're like, "Well, I don't want to get rid, I don't want those people around," <laughs> you're mm-hmm. you're becoming them, you know? Like, who's right? Who's the person that should be the the, the arbiter of truth and justice? You know what I mean? So yeah, that that's I see. I think there's some context that again, context is king, right? You got to figure mm-hmm. out what's going on with the context. And even though you don't like it, have that, th- that's kind of the, the the founding sort of thing of America is that we allow, even if it's totally offensive, right, like Nazis to exist or else we've outlawed Nazis. You can't be a Nazi, right? But wait a minute, that law is Nazistic. <laughs> Double-edged right? sword. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So anyway, totally side sidetrack and tangent now. Let's get back into Intolerant, the movie. Um, so that's kind of the overshadowing thing that I have with this this feature. But having said all of that, that's kind of the that taints it. I think, like as much as I I want to uh, affirm and and praise and lavish this movie for its all of its technical stuff, uh, all of that stuff I just said I think is worth saying because it taints the whole experience. Does that make sense? Yes. Like Sorry, if it didn't, if, if so. it hit in any of those things, I think I would have even not talked about it and just moved on to just like the technical stuff. Then would have been like how great he was and da 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 da. da you know, like we're gonna do like yeah, we're gonna no. we're gonna tackle some of like the F. W. Murder movies again. He was not a perfect human being either, but boy, you know, compared to this guy, he's kind of a saint. So, like, mm-hmm. with him, I'll focus more on his movies and his techniques and his technical stuff and his artistry and, you know, all that good stuff. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, are there, do you remember specific, uh, getting back into the movie itself, do you remember specific things from the movie that really popped out at you, like, in bold, in terms of technical things or story structure or things that you well... remember? Just the the main thing is that shot going into Babylon. Yeah. That's probably the most impressive one. Uh oh yeah, there was the one of the the what the young mother, the little deer, whatever her name is. They I no, I think it was it was either her or the other woman. They did this super extreme close up and the camera moved up to her. That was oh, yeah. kind of surprising to see. Not that it was in focus. It's the other girl, the killer. Okay, it is the killer. Yeah. Um I know I've seen a clip of it paused on that same woman too where she has a tear in her eye. Right. That's just like a random screen grab I've seen from Intolerance, but I didn't I don't really know the importance of that part. I mean, she's repenting, like, she's repenting for being the reason that she killed her husband during the squabble where her husband's going after the other woman, and then her husband comes in, then she gets shot, he gets shot. It's just a mess, and which is why the, the boy, the husband, gets arrested, because the cops just happen to be there, right. which in reality, they never are. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's all the nature of kind of the melodrama type thing that he himself, D.W. Griffith, was uh, a little ex machina type mm-hmm. plot point. So he's very famous for it. Also, like the whole drumming the um, action up towards the end and serving, saving people the last minute. Almost all his movies have that, too. Mm. But, um, yeah, that I think the whole point of that is because this is that character that girl first of all you have to remember i think she i i don't know if her parents or somebody died during the first strike so that workers strike and then there are people who the the capitalists they call it would shoot them the the people who were on strike and would kill Mm -hmm. them and so Mm -hmm. some of them would lose their jobs and that's the whole point is that they have to move on and so that girl ended up nowhere and um basically fell into a life of prostitution i think is the is the intention behind that and so and and the villain there in this the modern storyline is kind of like the pimp 
who was sending this the boy with the gun and going on errands and doing stuff. So, so I think because the boy showed her kindness during when they both escaped from the original strike, hmm. that she remember his kindness is why she decided to confess to the killing. So that yeah, she's not putting somebody that. like that, you know, uh, being killed and hung. And her guilt was overwhelming. And that scene with the whole weird camera angle where she's really close to the camera. And it, was, it actually looks like a horror shot. I don't know. That reminded me of a horror movie shot. But anyways, that whole scene and tear and everything, the whole point is that she feels this tremendous guilt. And unfortunately, it's like she's just a byproduct of capitalistic people. You know, like the, the, the manager who's cutting costs. 10% cut to all mm. the workers' wages and then they, the after, the afterwards they go on strike, you know. So that's what the movie's trying to show you is that as a result of economic problems, this girl or woman has to find a means to work as prostitute, but then squeeze to the limits. She shoots and kills the, her pimp and and she's kind of the, you know, tragic figure of that storyline because of her circumstances of which she has nothing to do with. She ends up being the killer, you know, mm. that's her tragedy, you know? So, and, and her, her killing the, the pimp person is really more about saving, um, the boy, you know, it wasn't really just, just killing for the sake of killing. So at least that's, that's true. The, you know, that's the, that's at least supposed to be that way. But mm-hmm. again, this is just a, like a very melodramatic anyways. So it doesn't, that doesn't take on to it more dramatic, more sort of uh real stakes drama as it were, as other type of filmmakers that come out. Now that capitalism and strike comes that remember we watched the movie strike. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, the Russians yes. really love this <laughs> segment. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, uh, actually, so D- Debbie Griffith, in order to recoup money, uh, because he spent so much money that even though he, he made money, the money basically broke even or less. He ended up recutting the movie so that the modern storyline was released uh, as its own movie hmm. in 1919. Okay, um, I could mean I could see that just because well, once you take it away from the you know the other three storylines it might right. i don't know i think just because that's yeah, called the you, mother and the law 1919 right here ugh. having everything co- you know correlate just like that is just it's too much i don't yeah. i don't know how these people did it back then i know they would have breaks in between but still it's just three I, I hour think, long I, I think that ugh. he was ahead of his time uh, i think that the audiences of uh 1916 um, I can't really digest that. It it was far too ahead of its time because they haven't had a chance with anything else, anything like it, you know. And nowadays we have so much, right? We have so mm-hmm. many. We have decades of decades of cinematography, movie experiences now, where these multi-threaded storylines is it's okay. It's like we can handle it now, you know. Like when cloud atlas came out i mean that was already hundreds of years after the fact you know and so we as the audience i think culturally can actually accept that and and comprehend that as much as we can you know what i mean and it, but even then like not everybody uh likes that it's a very artsy movie you know and so uh the birth of the nation was like a blockbuster more whereas intolerance was more like more artsy than the audiences were mm-hmm. used to. And that's why he kind of t- recouped money. He recut that as the mother in the law in 1919. And then he also did the fall of Babylon. He extracted all the Babylon scenes out as his own separate movie. So that's what happened. Hmm. So yeah, the, um, It's it had mixed reviews when it came out, so not everybody liked it. Um, but some people liked it. I don't know. It's it's it had mixed reviews back then. But so anything anything else? That's I I'll give you a list of what I thought was what that stood out this time around for me. Uh, this would be 
either the second or third time watching this for me, but uh, all of the big epic scenes, you know, were just as epic as I remember them. Uh, this is kind of like that 1916s version of stuff like the Lawrence Arabia. Huge, tremendous yes, epics. Yes, I did get that vibe when I watched that part. Yeah, or the Ten Commandments or any of those huge, tremendous epic movies where, you know, especially if you watch it on a projector, big screen, you'll see all those people flitting about and I don't think they still even have made any movies like this still you know like cast of hundreds of thousands with sets extensions that go crazy I mean things that were they're mm-hmm. doing in the silent film era not just him but others like um they can't afford that now I mean they all yeah. have to be on the budget and yeah Cecil gotta... B. DeMille himself mm-hmm. did a version of the Ten Commandments in silent movie and he built like real life size like Egyptian type, you know, props and sets, and that was just as expansive and large and expensive as this one. So they're all trying to up one another, you know, and and uh, so that's kind of huge. Uh, I would say, I, you know, a lot of it. It just goes on and on, you know. When you watch this movie, it's just like it's incredible. Um, the other thing is like some of the lighting is pretty interesting in this movie. Like the Mary, the Virgin Mary rocking the baby. There's a life shaft coming from the top. So that's a pretty cool uh, idea. Um, there's another scene towards the end when he's on the death row, the the boy. Mm-hmm. And the priest is giving his last rites. And he's looking up. You can see the light reflected in his eyeballs like at the screen. So if the, the, hmm. the, the camera is on a close-up of the actor. Um and um, let me get his name. I'm going to forget. The boy, Robert Heron. So he he's looking up at the screen as if looking up at heaven. And if he's looking, his, his eyes is looking up and the, the camera's on a close-up. And inside of his eyes, you could see the light reflecting off of his eyeballs. Like that's hmm. a great, you know, again probably happen in stands like oh yeah you think that's great yeah i'll do more of that <laughs> <laughs> but that's one of, one of those happy quints and also i think that he had help there was um another cameraman person who's not credited on or maybe it is i don't know for sure but i forgot his name now but he's he's the one that's more artistic and is kind of helping things uh plot along that way so it may have been him more than uh the billy fitzer guy so those are kind of the two highlights, and I know it's a really long movie, but that's kind of what I I uh, remember seeing here. Um, the most effective storylines were the uh, the modern storyline and then the Fall of Babylon storyline. Um, and, you know, Constance Talmadge is great. The mountain girl who would just take no crap, you know. So mm. she's great there uh, in that Fall of Babylon story. Um, the French story wasn't as effective, I don't think, and neither was the Christ story element. I think the French story was just too short, yeah. <laughs> you know. Even though <laughs> it's the same with the Christ story too, and, and yeah, they again, just I get his him point. In there. Of trying to tie all these themes together, but it's almost like if you cut those, those, even if you took those two out, it would still be okay. I think it's like people wouldn't miss a thing. He's just trying to like yeah. be more artistic by tying all these different themes together. You know, that's his chick. So, yeah, cuz that's one thing I I couldn't really figure out myself cuz um like if Jesus was around during the Babylonian era, but I I think he was before. Oh, they're, yeah, no, they're different even... times. So you could one Yeah, of that's them what is... I wasn't sure cuz yeah, I Yeah, they're different times, uh... yeah. So one's 539 BC, one's uh uh 27 AD and then uh, the French one was 1572 and the other one's modern time. Modern to then, 1914. So Okay. So yeah, I've seen times. Cuz I know they mentioned, you know, the it the, you know, they have those slates with the I, I'm assuming it was Jewish writing or something on it at one point. So, you know, that would be is or is Israeli Israel, I wasn't sure. I was like sorry, my brain's getting tired again. Yeah, that's all right. But that's really the highlight I have. And mm-hmm. the only, only thing that I can remember being discussed in some of the uh, behind the scenes stuff is that 
the the during the strike scene for the modern story time uh, do you remember the so first of all to clarify a few things the 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 feminist group wasn't really a feminist group they came from a group that is labeled the uplifters yeah uh, the uplifters is like a more high class club of like rich people that's essentially okay. what the uplifters are they're not actually a feminist thing and even when the film came out there are groups who were claiming that D.W. Griffith was sexist because she basically she's he's basically equating these uplifters as feminist groups and also saying that they're like Pharisees. They're like negative. They're not good people and they're trying to yeah. inflict their views. So that's not what he's saying. I think what he's trying to say is the uplifters. If you lived in that time, the 1915-ish era, you would have known that the uplifters is a social club. Of rich, 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 uh, upper, super high, cl- upper class, uppity ups, hmm. and it's almost like um, I can't even think of any equivalents today. But like, you know, like Silicon a, Valley a yacht club. I don't know. Yeah, whatever. I, I, <laughs> so some some rich club type people, and it's ex- and it's actually mostly men. So that's the only uh thing that he spun on its head a little bit. He made it like a female version of that, which. In my research, I don't know for sure, but in my research, it didn't really exist that I could find. Hmm. So the Uplifters, the name signifies a male-only club. There's no women allowed in it. Um, but there are there weren't any women-only Uplifter type clubs, like using that Uplifter name. So he kind of was using that to basically, at least my, I'm guessing, to just inflict intolerance upon the dear one saying how she was a bad mother took the mother yeah. away was kind of they're kind of representative of a symbolic of something else in society of moralistic slash religious very uptight type people you know mm. so i don't think they're representing like the feminist movement or anything like that that is 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 a subtext that might not be there right yeah so it's kind of because i mean yeah it's besides subtext it's you know you have to know the context of that time period too with who the uplifters were so that's probably why i didn't really get their point i just figured they're like you know feminist prohibition ladies who just i don't know like you know you see them in a bad light you don't see any good qualities in their characters because really they're not portrayed that way they're just portrayed as like ruining lives kind of a symbol or representative of like all society's judgments on yeah the boy and the dear one and how they're living their lives. It's kind of they're representing symbolism. But, 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 but rewinding a little bit into that uh, capitalist person um, where... So the premise is that there's a guy who is running a factory and he has a sister and his sister is the one who is in the Uplifter Club. And she is donating a lot of money by asking him to donate money. So... His sister is the one that's convincing her brother, who is the owner of this factory, to uh, donate a lot of money to power these uplifter clubs to have their um, sort of um, sort of moralistic, Pharisaic okay. sort of, like ideas, right? That's the whole mm-hmm. po- plot point. Now, he is actually is supposed to be representative of Rockefeller. So he, uh, so uh, D.W. Griffith really disliked um, people who are trying to make slaves, I guess, out of these workers. Mm-hmm. And that's why, like, if you were from that time, you would have seen that there was actually a real life event. Um, I forgot the name now, but there's a uh, real life event around the time these movies were made. And if you were watching this, you would have immediately have known that it was Rockefeller and he was trying to tighten up wages for capitalism reasons mm. and people went on strike. And then uh, the national guard or people, both the government officials, as well as the company people actually shot and killed a bunch of people who were on okay. strike. Okay, Yeah. Cause that's what happens in the movie. So exactly. Right. So that correlating. is correlating. It was basically like a one-to-one dig. And when he hired the actor, the actor almost looked like Rockefeller too, has a likeness to him. Hmm. And also like, and he, and one little clinch point, like the thing that clinches the whole thing is like the, when he saw a penny and he picked it up or whatever coin, I don't know if it's a penny, but that money Oh on yeah, the that floor. other guy, he was like yeah. working for the Rockefeller character and he just, but he was looking at the girl and 
I don't know. That that seems. Well, no, kind no, he is the too. Rockefeller guy. He's he is the kind of the the boss guy. He picked up the coin. He was inspecting out the party. He was like, oh, these oh, guys are partying okay. until ten, and they should be in bed and ready for work tomorrow, right? Oh, okay. I thought it was two different characters. Yeah, so he picks up a coin and he shines it. He's like, oh, put it in his pocket. And that's Rockefeller's kind of story is that uh, he says his wealth begins with the first coin or whatever he picked up. So, like, Hmm. again, it's it's a totally a whole, like, thing about, like, how, you know, capitalism has overtaken. Remember, this is post, like, industrial age, right? So he's making a huge criticism about uh, he would have probably known about, like, Updike and all the criticisms about the jungle, um, you know, ideas and stuff like that. So, yeah, anyways. very, very interesting. I mean, yeah. <laughs> now that we're actually, you know, really digging into intolerance, it, <sighs> there's so many, there's so many different things in this movie. But like you said, just throw it all in the kitchen sink. I mean, yeah, you could have just had the modern period as a film itself, and it, if you expanded on it, people would probably have gone nuts. <laughs> But well, that's why he recut mm. it later to recoup cost. So. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. That's really, I think, all I had. I didn't, um, I didn't yeah, really I like didn't... sit down and had some extensive stuff. I mean, no, we... I didn't have time to look up any notes. Yeah, I, uh... just finishing the movie <laughs> was a task on itself. <laughs> oh my gosh! I mean, I had it on like one point five speed to kind of get through it. Cause, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because once again, I didn't. I was like, oh, it. This is is three and a half hours. Oops, because I actually it sure watched is. it earlier today. It's almost I didn't like a Netflix to. series. You have to binge oh, through, you know. I know, and I, ugh, I don't even binge Netflix. I've, last thing I watched was like when cor- the virus started. I think back in March, <laughs> and I finished it in like two days, like some anime series. Woo. <laughs> So anyways, that's um, our, my take on it. Um, the Intolerance, it's, it's a great technical achievement, and it still is. Um, it's not the first, per se. Uh, there are a lot of, again, mm-hmm. Italian cl- uh, epics <laughs> that have done similar things, and as well as many other filmmakers and artists that also have done very similar things in terms of the scope and the themes, but not all of it in a single film. So I, I guess... Nope. <laughs> That's the one sort of unique feature of his on this film. And talking multiple storylines, all trying to say something, but I don't think 100% successfully. Yeah. Because it's just too too long. It's just mm-hmm. way too long. Too long. So it, too it long needed... and not like... He, uh... It's one of those situations where he's an artist and he uh, got famous and then nobody wants to cut him, right? Nobody's going to yeah. produce this uh, film and be like, hey, Griffith, this just too long it's not making sense and you got to cut it down so nobody's telling him no it's it's a typical artist um situation where you know you get popular you get famous and all of a sudden like you got big britches too <laughs> yeah and, and nobody can tell you no now 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 he's you know so that's that's the excess so it it has you know its problems in summary like i already said it has these foundational problems of his perspective and view of why he's making it and calling it intolerance, mm. you know, of his problematic views. <laughs> Ugh. Um, so that I think overshadows some of the artistic thing. That's not to say it, it isn't skillful. Uh, it is. It's just, it, it, I just have a hard time reckoning both. Right. So yeah, myself personally. Um, I mean, it's like, if you were going to recommend one of the other movie to people, yeah, I'd just be like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I think he's done other movies. He's done stuff like he, his shorts are pretty good. And there are other movies after this. Um, uh, Orphan something. That one's pretty good. The, 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 the something broken blossom. Oh, that is the one with the broken blossoms. That's that with is, Lillian Gish, I think. Yeah. Well, there, most of them are, I mean, a lot of them are Lillian Gish, but that that is the one with the uh, Chinese uh, racism one, maybe I, I can't Ooh. remember now. But anyway, so there's a number of stories that he's done, and I think that they it's more straightforward and linear and less crazy. So it, he goes on to make more movies after this. So, but mm-hmm. l- less crazy. I think I think this is the straw that broke the camel's back for him. He mm-hmm. just got way too ambitious, mm-hmm. and that really came to bite him at, afterwards, and he kind of stopped doing this and he can't anymore because nobody's gonna allow him to spend all this money anymore you know yeah 
Do you know how long this took to film? Does it say in the notes? Uh, he Just, started working on it right after... Birth of a um, Nation, so that's 15. But that yeah. doesn't mean it wasn't... Well, probably 14. That's when yeah. he started making this. I don't know. I got to... I gotta look that up. I I don't know. I I don't want to say like almost feel like it's a not a full year, but at least it's got to be at least that because you gotta build everything, especially for that scene. It's and make sure it's all stable because you know I'm I they built the ca- not the castle walls, but they built walls and then those things to make the ca- uh like the towers. It, I, they reminded me of like the Trojan horse, but they were square horses. <laughs> um. Yeah, so that alone, I mean, depending on how many men you can hire to build it, you know, correctly, that's that's at least a month, or if not longer. I don't know. Yeah, it's, uh, the record keeping is also challenging, just in general. Mm. Um, so I'm not sure. I don't know how long it took for him to make this. Maybe other, uh, maybe other books and stuff like that. that yeah, that I'd probably know. say in his biography. Or, yeah, I don't know if I would trust this biography because, um, like many artists of that time, they often treat it as just making things up. They don't remember a lot of details. So it's not like a very detail-oriented hmm. work. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I had to. Some of these books might have details on how long it took the production to make. My guess is at least a couple of years. It's got to be at least more than that because mm. they couldn't have cobbled together all those things so quick. The battle scenes were also pretty crazy too. Battle it reminds me cool. a lot of the, like, like the those. modern battle scenes when they mm. when they're doing uh, uh, sort of classical style, you know, battles and stuff. So like Lord of the Rings. <laughs> that reminds me of that oh, yeah. a little bit with the battle yeah, ramp. That- that did remind me uh, this movie did remind me of lord of the rings probably because of how l- much longer it was but yeah. i mean lord of the rings is pretty <laughs> it's pretty good you don't have to be a nerd to appreciate those movies exactly. they're really good <laughs> yeah. well that's all i got on tolerance um I, I i know more probably could be done in a scene by scene breakdown but i just i i don't know if i was quite into that because of those problems i've had with it and mm-hmm. so yeah i just have a very conflicted feeling and view about this movie and just relationship with uh dw griffith as in films so <laughs> <laughs> so anyways all right any uh parting thoughts from you uh not so much the movie but i did want to mention the thing i talked about earlier so for our viewers, uh, a friend of mine's brother recently died along with his cat and dog. So in the show notes, we'd appreciate it if you'd think about considering donating to their family for his funeral. Um, I don't. I know he wasn't into silent films, but I think he was a film buff. So anything that could, that could go towards his uh, funeral or burial, however they do it, it would be really helpful and appreciated, even if it's just a dollar um because they're really hurting because it was such a freak circumstance so uh thank you in advance if you're able to donate and possibly share the gofundme link it's at uh http the dot slash slash gf dot me slash u slash y f d nine five f and once again that'll be linked in our show notes thank you Yes, thanks for uh, putting that in there. And then, um, anything else? Um, intolerance. I don't know. <laughs> That's all I got. I mean, learned a lot more about Griffith this way. Um, it's like once again, did I hate it? No. Did I love it? No. I, I guess it's intolerance is really an experience because of how grand it is. That's like that's a that's one. That's really how you can call this movie. It's a grand scale. Everything in it is lavish. It's grand. You look at it, you're like, wow. Especially for certain scenes. Acting's pretty good. You know, for what it, for the time period, you can tell it's still like the theater actions. In other times, it's kind of more subtle. 
but it's definitely worth a watch. Maybe if you have a full free day and you're willing to spend that time to watch it. <laughs> uh, but just if you can be aware of the context of the film and see why intolerance is the way it is. All right. And that wraps up our podcast today. And uh, once again, you can find more of our stuff at watching silent films, plural dot wordpress.com against watching silent films, plural dot wordpress.com. And also send us an email. If you have thoughts, comments, ideas at watching silent films, plural at gmail.com. And uh, that'll be all for today. Thank you, Lily. Thank you. Listeners. Thanks, Yifong. <laughs>